Welcome, boys and girls, to our first uh, webcam uh, classroom, our first flip classroom. Today, we'll be going through the text, uh, the test of the great boat, the Odyssey. Um, this is the second time we've seen, actually, our main character, Penelope, um, use great wit and to outwit these suitors. Um, the first time we actually experienced her doing such a thing was weaving the tapestry, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But um, just first of all, I want to congratulate you for making it here. Um, thank you for viewing the video. And uh, hopefully we'll do a lot more of these as this should free up some time for our classroom. So we're going to try out this flip model and see if you like it. Um, so anyway, I'm going to pull up a video here, first of all, to talk about Queen Penelope. And just to kind of show you how she starts to hold off the suitors. I believe Odysseus, king of Ithaca, is dead. Yes. I do not. Today, I will begin to weave a shroud for my lost husband. If he is not seen in Ithaca, before I finish, I will choose one of you to take his place beside me. I will send for maidens to help you. I alone must do this work. <laughs> weave alone? We'll be old men by the time you finish. <laughs> You have brought gifts to my door. I have given you a proper feast in return. Now I depend on your honor. Return to your homes. When my work is done, you will hear my decision. We will stay where we are. We will not leave here until you choose. Leave slowly. Your husband's wine is very good. <laughs> The actions of the suitors here. Um, Odysseus is not able to see while he's doing while the, while he's away, but you know that as he returns as a beggar, he's going to be able to watch these suitors and how they act. And you better believe guys like Antinous, the ringleader, those will be the first ones to be um, put to death. And you can see here, Penelope, she's weaving the shroud that she claims is for her lost husband, but we know in the text is really for layer two. Winter. Um, Penelope again weaving but yet as the poem said unweaving at night um, and she's able to hold the suitors at bay for three years three whole years while she unweaves at night only one of her servants can so it is this. true oh <laughs> I do not mean to frighten you to enter your room but I had to see oh my Leave me. It is a mistake. Now your deceit can only bring trouble. I will not speak a word, but your maid, she may tell another. That's it. The men don't like this very much when they all find out about it. And he But as I said, this is the first occasion where Penelope is set as a major character who's able to hold off 100 suitors, able to keep them at bay and outwit them for three entire years. This great test called the Test of the Great Bow. And um, you can follow along in your textbook. But if not, uh, just in case you didn't bring that home, I do have a text here that we're going to kind of go through. Okay. So first of all, uh, Penelope goes off to the vaults where she's going to pull open the doors. And these doors have been sealed basically for 20 years and where she's going to uh, pull out Odysseus's bow. So I would like you to take a couple of seconds here while I pause the video. I'm going to pause my recording. You should pause as well. And I would like you to read basically from lines 1083 all the way through to about 1108. Eight here. The queen reached the storeroom door and halted. So you should be able to read from 1083 down to 11, 1110 here, okay? Pause now and, and give that a read. Now, hopefully you were able to read the text there while you paused. Uh, a couple of things I want to point about, out about this. A bellow like a bull's vault, vaunt in a meadow, followed by her light footfall entering over the plank floor. So she opens these big doors and there's like a, a bellow like a bull goes, you know like can you imagine those doors those big safe doors 
entering into this room where she's going to pull down from this peg this polished bow in a case. Now, she holds her husband's bow in her hands and she sinks to her knees where she starts to bite her lip and sob because this bow is symbolic of her husband, the strength of her husband, and she's going to let some suitors try to string this bow to win her love. And she she's realizing that she's this close to basically you know getting remarried and and this is finally hitting her a couple of nice uh, footnotes they have here may not be the footnotes that match in the book but you know it just talks about her milk white arms really showing how ladylike she is uh, very pale arms things like that um, but there's some great foreshadowing here because as we read about um, in our next reading it is um, death at the palace she talks about bringing down this tremendous bone hand and on her shoulder hung the quiver spiked with coughing death it's right here quiver spike it says uh in number two possibly foreshadowing the death of the suitors possibly indeed foreshadowing the death of the suitors this is awesome because if you think about an arrow it has a spike at the top of it and it's spiked with coughing death remember that because as we read about the first suitor to die odysseus is going to send this arrow right straight through one of the one of the guy's throats and this coughing death um, is, is definitely foreshadowing. But a quiver, just in case you guys don't know, the quiver is that that um, leather tube that holds the arrows in it, and you can put it over your back. Um, you'll see that on uh, the god Artemis, but, um, and probably in the Hunger Games, you've probably seen the quivers. Um, anyway, I want to read with you. I'm going to read this aloud uh, where she comes in and gives them the challenge, okay? My lords, hear me. Suitors indeed, you recommend this house to feast and drink and day and night, my husband being long gone, long out of mind. You find no justification for yourselves, none except your lust to marry me. I want to point out lust in here because lust is one of the um, seven deadly sins in the Bible. And remember, we're reading Greek mythology printed thousands of years before the Bible. They, the Greeks still have many of the same religious values that um, many of us hold true in the Bible. Kind of neat. So nothing but your lust to marry me. Well, stand up then. We now declare a contest for that prize. Here is my lord Odysseus's hunting bow. Bend it, string it if you can, who sends an arrow through iron axe hell sockets, twelve in line. I join my life with his and leave this place my home my rich and beautiful bridal house forever to be remembered though I only dream it. Now, there's the next part that obviously messes people up. When you're reading Homer, when you're reading Shakespeare for that matter, we're reading things that may not be familiar to us. You may have to break it down. You may have to Google search. You may have to try to figure out where can I find this information. Through iron, axe, hell, sockets. Twelve in line. So, if you think about an axe, um, axe hell sockets they're going to show in the video i'm going to actually show a little clip um sockets where the axes have at the bottom a place where you can hang them up an axe hell which basically holds like this if we line up 12 of these in a row would you be able to shoot an arrow through all 12 okay so not only does she make this very difficult because nobody can string odysseus's bow his bow is super tough strong wood probably made of oak and he, nobody's even able to string it. But it, just in case you can, she's going to set up this impossible challenge. What is she doing? Again, avoiding the task of having to marry any man other than her husband. Ironically, dramatic irony, remember, we know something the characters don't know. We know Odysseus is there, dressed as the beggar. So this is just building the suspense. Remember, we're just building suspense this entire time because Odysseus can string his own bow. And this task is something he used to do. That's just a challenge. Two men had meanwhile left the hall. This is uh, line 1122 here. Uh, had left the hall, swineherd and cowherd in companionship. One downcast as the other, but Odysseus followed them outdoors. So Odysseus, dressed as a beggar, is moving outside with these two other men. The swineherd, who is he? Oh, do I hear an answer? Yes, that's right. Eumaeus. Good job. Thanks for raising your hand. Okay. A swineherd is met with a cowherd and their companions, and they're leaving the room. They don't want to see anybody string the bow and win Penelope's hand in marriage. They don't want a part of this. They're one as downcast as the other. But Odysseus, remember, disguised as the beggar, is going to follow them outdoors, outside the court. 
And I'm on line 1126. Read along with me. And coming up, said gently, You herdsman, and you too swineherd, I could say a thing to you. Or should I keep it dark? No. Now speak. My heart tells me. Would you be man enough to stand by Odysseus if he came back? Suppose he dropped out of a clear sky, as I did. Suppose some god should bring him in. Would you bear arms for him or for the suitors? Now remember, they think they're talking to a beggar. What's this guy want with them and their information, right? Well, the cowherd is the first to step up. This is not Eumaeus, the swineherd. This is another guy who Odysseus thinks he can trust. He can't beat these suitors by himself. He needs help. He knows he has Telemachus, but he needs somebody else. The cowherd said, Ah, let that master come. Father Zeus, grant our old wish. It's like he's saying, We've been praying for this for some time. Grant our old wish. Some carrier guide him back. Then judge what stuff is in me and how I manage arms. Likewise, Eumaeus fell to praying all heaven for his return so that Odysseus, sure, at least of these told them well i'm at home but kind of like stop your praying i am home for i am he i bore adversities but in the 20th year i am ashore on my own land i find the two of you alone among my people longed for my coming home prayers i never heard except for that i might come again so now what is in store for you i'll tell you if Zeus brings down the suitors by my hand, these are some answers in your question, in your packet. I hope you're doing these as well. Whenever we're doing reading, we're doing our packet. If Zeus brings down the suitors by my hand, I promise marriages to both. First of all, these are suitor, these are servants, excuse me. Servants aren't allowed to be married. He goes, I promise the two of you, you will both be able to be married. Second, cattle, which is ownership, possession. He goes, I promise you, you will have some cattle. And also, houses built near mine. You're filling this in in your packet, right, boys and girls? So, houses built near mine. And you shall be brothers in arms of my Telemachus. Brothers in arms of my Telemachus. He's going to allow them to be soldiers, which is actually a very noble thing in this time period. Brothers in arms to Tele Telemachus. Here, let me show you something else. A sign that I am he. That you can trust me. Look at this old scar from the tusk wound that I got boar hunting on Parnassus. So Odysseus is going to show him a scar on his thigh. And he's going to say, this I got long before when I was a child. You guys know this. You know I'm he. He shifts his rags. I'm on 1155, line 11, number 55. He bared the long gash, and both men looked and knew and threw their arms around the old soldier, weeping, kissing his head and shoulders as well, and took each man's heads and hands to kiss, then said to cut it short else they might weep till dark. And they definitely don't want people to see them crying when holding each other. Break off no more of this. Anyone at the door could see them and tell them and drift back in, but separately at intervals after me. So he's like, I'm going to go in the house, and you guys are going to come after with me. Now listen to your orders. When the time comes, those gentlemen to a man will be dead against giving me a bow or quiver. You've got to defy them. Eumaeus, bring the bow and put it in my hands. Nobody's going to want a beggar to try this bow. They're going to be insulted. But you may ask, you've got to give me a chance. Put the bow in my hands. You know I can do it. What in essence he's going to do is, is give a weapon to Odysseus, right? So they're at the door. Tell the women to lock their own door tight. And tell them if someone hears the shock of arms and groans of men in the hall or court, not one must show her face, but keep still at her weaving, right? Be the noble ladies that you are. Go weave. Don't listen to the deaf. That's going to come in this palace. Philodius, run to the other gate and lock it. There we learn our name of our goat herd. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the goat herd. Because there's a goat herd and a swine herd. Philodius is our goat herd. Okay. Run to the outer gate and lock it. And throw a crossbar and lash it. And the text kind of jumps here a little bit. Odysseus took his time, turning the bow, tapping it every inch. For borings and termites might have made. He's worried termites have been in it. He's checking over the strength, right? while the master of the weapon was abroad. The suitors were now watching him, and some jested among themselves. Oh, a bow lover, dealer in old bows. Hey, maybe he has one like it at home, you know, and they're all going to laugh because they're like, yeah, maybe some beggar has some bow like this at home. He has an itch to make one for himself. 
He goes, see how he handles it, the sly old buzzard. This is the best guy. One disdainful suitor added this. If your fortune grows an inch, every inch you bend it. Well, every inch he bends it, his fortune does continue to grow. Very ironic uh, verbal irony we get there. <clears throat> but the man skilled in all the ways of contending, sanitized by the bow's look and heft, like a musician, like a harper. I want to point this out because this is a great simile. He's comparing him to a harper here. When a quiet hand upon his instrument, he draws between his thumb and forefinger a new sweet string upon a peg. So effortlessly, Odysseus, in one motion, strung the bow, and then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it. So the taut gut, vibrating, hummed and sang a swallow's note. In here, this point, the taut gut, what you need to understand is the string of a bow was actually made out of intestine, gut, from an animal. And this intestine, when you string it and you dry it, becomes very tough, very strong, and you know, very good and flexible for the for the bowstring. What they're doing is comparing Odysseus stringing this bow to a guy stringing a harp. Now, <clears throat> I don't have a harp, but I do have a guitar. I hope you know that. And uh, basically, when I string a guitar, it's as like a like a musician, like a harper stringing his instrument. He just puts a fresh string, and with one effortless motion, is able to string it, and then slides his right hand down the cord. and plucks it and think about that reverberating in a room of 100 men old beggar strung the bow and this reverberating note is just singing in this hallway of silence don't forget Odysseus has a task to to um, to complete Take a look at this next part here. In the hushed hall, it smote the suitors, and their faces all changed. You bet! They're a blanched, they're white. Then Zeus thundered overhead, one loud crack for a sign, and Odysseus laughed within him that the son of crooked-minded Cronus, remember Cronus' uh, son is Zeus, Zeus strikes a thunderbolt just to kind of say, Hey, Odysseus, I'm with you. Where it lay, rest where it's still in the quiver with the young man's turn to come. He knocked it, taps it, you know, lets it rest across the handle grip, drew the string in the groove butt of the arrow, aimed it where it sat upon the stool, and now it flashed. The arrow twang, bow, clean as a whistle, through every socket ring, and it grazed not one. To thun with heavy brazen head beyond. Then quietly said, Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. And I did not miss either. I didn't take all day stringing the bow. My hand, my eyes are sound. Not so contemptible as the young men say. Well, the hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton. Supper by daylight. Other amusements later. He's being a little sarcastic here. With a song and a harpin that adorn a feast. Telemachus, your mother now has a husband. Let's cook some food and party. Being, you all can go home now suitors and you know kind of like keeping their guard down because really he looks like a dangerous man with a bow in his hand and you know a whole quiver full of arrows well what really happens is he drops his eyes I'm on line 12 16 drops his eyes and nodded and the prince Telemachus true son of King Odysseus belted his sword on clapped his hand to his spear and with the clink and glitter of clean bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father. The cool thing is, is that everything locked in. There are no other weapons in there because, see, the swine herd and the cow herd have already taken all the spears and all the other weapons out of the room. The only weapons in the room, Telemachus's sword, Odysseus's bow and arrow. And uh, these men are all basically sitting ducks. Um, so their plan comes to a great, you know, conclusion and... Uh, we're going to have death at the suitors next in your reading. Now, but if you want to see what I'm talking about, you can continue to watch video uh, at your own leisure, but you're not required to. This is, uh, I'm going to show you a video of him stringing this bow. The goat. the goat herd, he's with us. He may be trusted. Hello, Tia, the goat herd, he's with us. Spreading him. Tell us, Shepard. What is your mistress's plan? I will tell you all. something accurate. Wow. 
This is the bow of Odysseus, king of Ithaca. The man who strings it and shoots an arrow cleanly through all 12 axes will take his place. What? This is no way to choose. It cannot be done! My father did it. Ooh! Huh? Maybe he can do it. Wait! Wait, you will not see the winner. You are all the same to me. Oh, 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 oh. It's not fair! I've never struck a bow. This is not right! I gave up 50 sheep! A hundred goats! As gifts from Delicia! And uh, then fool. <laughs> it's impossible. He won't be able to do it. Only two tries, Eurymachus. You can't do it. No, no, he's going. No. <laughs> Farewell, Odysseus. I have been true to my word. Telemachus has ordered us to the maid chambers. We're to lock ourselves in. Lock yourselves in. Hide them. Hide them. Hide them. Hurry. Oh, what else do you can see? The men are taking all the swords, all the weapons, out of the room. And you can there's nothing for the suitors to have. That be with us. Temple of Athena. Odysseus has one of these. <laughs> I've waited long enough. Give it here, weakling. Now watch this. Come on, Angelus. Let's see him do it. Come on. Come on. Can. What about the man who was dead? No man alive. Great, great irony. Verbal irony here. No man alive can do it. They all think Odysseus is dead, right? What about a, what about a dead man? Latching the door shut. The suitors don't even know this. <laughs> what are you doing? There was no twang though. He needed a twang. I knew the guitar go. He didn't do that. I'm gonna scare the cat out of poop out of them. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Who are you, old man? I have to translate for you because it can't speak very well. Odysseus. Odysseus. I think these guys are in trouble. I think they're starting to recognize they're in trouble. Telemachus. Now's the right time for your anger. Mm, is now the right time for your anger? That's for the story Death at the Palace. That's next time.